Well, praise the Lord. How can you believe it's the last Sunday of the year? Time certainly flies. It certainly flies. And uh, just reflecting on the past week, the couple of great presentations that uh, talked about the real meaning of Christmas, and our hearts were touched deeply by it for sure. But what I've noticed in the years that I've lived, some 65 plus years that I've lived, immediately following Christmas, we get this thing called the New Year. I don't know if that'll ever change, but uh, it's been a pattern pretty straightforward for the last 65 years since I've been around, so um, I don't expect it to change. And so you gear up for a big celebration, and then you have to realize you're standing on the precipice of a new year. And the key word is the word new. New. We all like new things, new cars, new clothes, new, I have a new ring, I have a new whatever it might be. And so the year that's coming is a new year. Never been touched, never been lived in, never been affected in any way by human life because we've not been there. And uh, what I find, I, what I find personally, and I don't know about you, but what I find personally is that the, the new is a time to reflect. New is a time to make plans. It's a time to make resolves. How many, how many uh, are in the practice of making New Year's resolutions? Just, just, you just do that just automatically. How many keep your New Year's resolutions? <laughs> Same number every year. <laughs> Same number every year. But there is something, uh, there's something about new. In fact, um, in, in the Old Testament in particular, the new year was a tremendous time that, that, uh, that reflected the values of, of the nation of Israel, certainly, because that was the, the um, core people that the Old Testament revolved around. And God actually gave incredible instructions to the Jewish nation uh, about the new year. When, you, when, uh, when the new year comes, when the new year comes, when you go into your new land, when you go into your new... And there's a fair amount of emphasis there. So it's not unusual then to, at this time of the year, look at this concept of the new year that's coming at us. But one of the, one of the things that that requires of us to do is to look at the old year for a moment. The year we just came through, it's been an incredible year. It's been a year like, really, no other year. Things happened in this year, past, or the year that we're in right now, that will affect us for years to come if Jesus tarries. Laws were made. Practices were begun. Political changes unfolded, and many, many other things. And so as I began to prepare for this morning, I found myself doing a, a quick inventory of what we're looking at in this year, past, that is, that is, is, is really, uh, in many cases, a, a, an introduction to 2015. What have we come through in 2014? Apart from our personal struggles, apart from our family or, or personal lives, what have we seen as, as a nation? What have we seen as a world? What has dominated the news in our world in 2014? Let me just give you a few highlights. New diseases or old diseases, diseases coming back with a, with a vengeance. Let me remind you of Ebola and how that has touched so many people. Let me remind you of terrorism that finally arrived on our shores at Parliament Hill. We've been watching it for the last number of years boil in the Middle East and, and throughout the, uh, Asia, but finally it gets to our shores. We have seen again a, a, a concentrated attack upon God's natural people, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, both militarily and politically. We've watched those things happen. We've seen Russia rise up against her neighbor nations like Ukraine and the Crimea and other areas. We've seen Russia aligning herself with Israel's enemies, which speaks so loudly of the prophetic word given by the old prophet Ezekiel. We've seen the Western world, our part of the world, we've seen them blessing what God has cursed, and in not so subtle ways cursing 
and calling blessed what call, God calls evil. We've seen that. We've seen violence and demonstrations in the streets, civil law breaking down. We watched yesterday as, as 25,000 policemen gathered in New York City to bury a wonderful godly policeman who was simply gunned down with his partner because he wore a police officer's outfit. Violence in the land, protests and, and disruptions. This is what we see. We see countries and issues of biblical prophecy coming to the forefront. The Bible talks about certain issues we're seeing them come. Talking about certain, certain countries, we're seeing it happening. What does all mean? What does all this mean for 2015? Well, the Bible calls it perilous times. Paul, through young Timothy, said that in the last days, perilous times shall come. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus, in Luke 21 and 25, talking about these days, called it nations in distress without solutions. That's, if you read the, 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 the actual words of Jesus there, he says, the nations are in distress in this season without solutions. And so that's the picture of the world we live in. That's the picture of the world that, we, is it, that now is in our rearview mirror for 2014 and is in our front headlights for 2015. It's the world we live in. But let me for a moment diverse a little. In spite of all that we have seen, I believe that 2015 will be a year like we have never seen before. I believe that what we have seen in 2014 will pale in comparison to what we have seen in 2014. I believe 2014 has been the harbinger. It has been the introduction to things in every circle that you name, from the circle of, of politics and military and, and all of these things, you've seen an introduction in this year. And so then as we stand on the, prim, the precipice of this new year in 2015, what will our thoughts and our outlook be? What are we thinking? It would be interesting this morning if we could interview about 25 people in this congregation and ask them what their thoughts are for 2015. You would hear a variety of, of, of observations. Some are hopes, some are dreams, some, some are frustrations, some are almost hopelessness and all of these things. So what are, what, what, what are the outlook for 2015? What will our thoughts be? How do we, how do we, how do we ana analyze the year that lies before us or project what it will be like? When you, get, when you hear all of this and you can become a little, a little scared, a little frustrated, a little afraid, a little uptight, and so that's the reason why we see so many people stressed out today. And you'll see it manifest itself in different ways, and all of a sudden you'll realize, what was that all about? And you realize it had nothing to do with you or your conversation or, or, any, or your presence. It's just that they live in a stress-packed world. Well, I want you to know that as believers, God don't want us to live in that kind of world. He said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, my peace I leave with you. That's this promise to his believers that we would have peace. We would have peace. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You say, well, how does that all play out in, in ordinary life? How does that play out? We, we know the context of the New Testament when Jesus said that to his disciples. We know what happened to the disciples. We know the Holy Spirit came. We know that they went out and, and a great revival began. We know that they became great preachers. And we kind of forget that most of them, in fact, practically all of them were put to death. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And the thing is... There's a big distance between that promise and the mansion. What do we do in the meantime? What do we do in the meantime with that huge difference from the promises of God to when we get in our mansion and put our feet up and say, boy, we got, we've made it. What do we do in the interim? That's what I want to deal with this morning for a few moments, if you allow me your time for the next hour and a half since we've got no service tonight. 
I take that smile as a nod of approval. <laughs> How does that all play out in practical life? I believe the answer lies in the prayer of Moses. The prayer of who? The prayer of Moses. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. Please. Just going to read verses 1 to 3. And then verses 12 to 16. Then I'm going to give you the context of this incident in, 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 in Exodus. Second book of the Bible, Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, Leave from here and go up yonder, you and the people which you have brought up with, up with you out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I spare unto Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and unto thy seed will I give it. And then note that second verse. And I will send an angel before you. If you're in the habit of, of underlining words, underline the word angel. I will send an angel. Underline these two words, an angel. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite onto a land flowing with milk and honey. Then underli underline this next phrase. For I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people. I'll explain that in a little bit. Come down to verse 12. Moses said unto the Lord, See, you have said unto me, Bring up this people, and you have not let me know who you're going to send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now the way that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord in the 15th verse, If your presence does not go with me, do not carry us up from here. For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The key verse here is the 15th verse. Moses said, if your presence don't go with us, don't take us into the promised land. Think about that for a moment. I want to speak for however long on the subject, Moses' greatest resolve. Moses' greatest resolve. We know Moses to be one of the greatest characters of the Word of God, bar none, both Old and New Testament. In fact, Elijah and Moses appeared on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus Christ. That's an incredible subject to look into sometimes. Elijah and Moses. Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire, and God personally conducted the funeral of Moses. The only two, only person in the hall of the Word of God that God did the funeral for. Very, very special people indeed. But here in the context of what I just read, God is angry with Israel because of Israel's sin. Israel's sin, of course, in this particular case, was the building of the golden calf. While Moses was in Mount Sinai receiving the law of, of, from God, the, the Aaron and, and the Israelites rebelled against God and built themselves a, a golden calf, called that their God, and it made God angry. Yet God was not about to forsake his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as I read in my text. God always fulfills his promise. God is always faithful in spite of our unfaithfulness. God will, will, will not fail his word. 
But you see, God, however, in, 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 in spite of, because of the, go, the rebellion, God says to them, look, in the second verse, I'm not going to go with you, but I'll send an angel. Think about that for a moment. Think about that. If we were seeking God's face and God showed up and said, look, I, I, I'm not going to be coming with you, but I'm going to send Gabriel. We'd have every camera from CNN, ABC, CBC, CTV, and all of the major networks come to our church because we want to show you Gabriel. Gabriel's going to be here. Oh, my goodness, that's going to put us on the radar. That's going to put us on the map. That's going to secure our place in history for sure. Gabriel came amongst us. See, Moses wasn't interested in Gabriel. Moses was interested in one thing, and that was the presence of God. The presence of God. How much and how many times do we settle for that which is less than the presence of God? Most leaders would have settled for that, but not Moses. And so we ask the question, was Moses being stubborn? No. No, you see, when you've had the real deal, it's really a problem settling for knockoffs. In golf, we, there, are the, there are the real, there's the real deals, right? There's the real manufacturers. There's the Nikes. There's the, there's the uh, I, I could go on down the list. There are the real clubs. And then all of a sudden, you'll see this Nike set of clubs for about 20% of the price you paid for it. And you wonder what went on there. But in the golf industry, as well as many industries, there is what's called the knockoff trade. And it costs the, man, the manufacturers millions and millions of dollars. So cheap countries in, in cheap companies in cheap co countries make all these imitations and they put the, the, the real name on it, but there's no substance to it. How often do we settle for that which is much less than what God intended for us to have? We get, a little, we get a little whiff of this presence and we settle for that. When God wants us to push through and have more. Moses had encountered the presence of God, you see. See, for Moses, he wasn't being stubborn. He had a, he had a priority in his life. He had, a, he had a, a, a number one desire in his spirit. And he understood this because he had encountered God that there was really no substitute for the presence of God. Moses had seen the, the presence. He had seen the presence in the Red Sea. He had heard the presence as the wind blew and suddenly the mighty Red Sea parted ways and the ground on which they walked over was dry ground. Ever notice that? You ever go to a beach or a... Or a, a, a if I say a bar, I don't mean a downtown club. I'm talking about a bar of sand that sometimes exists in a bay that when the water is low, there's a big body of water inside, then there's a bar of sand, and then outside there's the ocean. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Sure you do. And you go out, and you go out, and you get on that bar, and, 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 and you've got to be careful where you walk because it's saturated by water twice a day, so it's all quivering, and it's, it's like quicksand. And you've got to be really careful where you walk so you don't get stuck deep into it. But you see, in the Red Sea, when God's presence showed up, they walked over on dry land. You ever notice that? They walked over on dry land. So Moses had seen the presence of God. He had experienced the presence of God in the Red Sea. He had experienced the presence of God every morning when, when they go out and they look on the ground and they found the coriander seed and they found the, the manna and they saw the quails. It was an evidence of the presence of God with them. It was the provision of the presence of God with them. Moses knew about the, about the presence. He had seen the presence that day. When the Israelites had cried and said, you brought us out here to, to, to choke us to death because we have nothing to drink. Pray to your God and ask him to do something for us. And God, Moses went to God and said, God, listen, I got a problem. And if my, I got a problem. You got a problem. I got those a million or two million Israelites behind me and they're choking with drink. And we're in the desert. There's no drink. There's no water. What are we going to do about it? And God said, Moses, smite the rock. 
and he smote the rock. And suddenly, there was water in the desert. And folk, I don't, know to, I, I don't quite know how to explain this, but, but later on in the scriptures, we find that, that that rock followed them. It was a constant source of water for them for the time that they were in the wilderness. Forty years. Paul is very bold when he says that that rock was Christ. And that's a whole another line of teaching. Because the second time that God, that he needed water, God said, speak to the rock. Moses was angry and smote the rock. And violated God's principle. And that's the reason why he didn't go into the promised land. Because you see, the rock was Christ, and Christ was only smitten once. Not twice. You understand? That's good. That's, that should sit you back, send you back home and check that out. See, Moses has seen the presence of God. Once you have seen the presence of God, once you have lived in the presence of God, there, there's, no, there's no substitute for it. There's no knockoff for the presence of God, even though the church, the Western church in particular, keeps, keeps entertaining knockoffs of the presence of God. But really, it doesn't exist. So Moses was not about to take his people into the promised land without God's presence. God said, I'm going to send an angel with you. But he said, I'm not going to go with you, Moses, then we're not going. If you don't go with us, we can't go. Why did Moses, why was he so adamant? Why was he so dogmatic? Can I use the word stubborn? Do you know that sometimes stubbornness is good? Oh, that guy is stubborn. It depends on what he's stubborn about. If he's stubborn about a, a value, that's worth it. If he's stubborn about the, the, the values of God's word, that's worth it. God called us to be dogmatic about what his word says. See, Moses knew the heart of the people. Moses could not imagine going into the promised land with this tribe of Israelites the way they were. Without the presence of God. He was one that could take on anything if the presence of God was there. He was one. And so he said, God, I'm not going unless you go with us. He had a resolve that he would not go into that uncharted territory. Oh, today that the church would look at 2015 and say, God, we don't want to go into 2015 unless we know that you're with us, that we're walking in your way, that we're pleasing you. I don't want to take my family in there, God. I don't want to take my, my, my wife. I don't want to take my life into 2015 unless I know you're there with me. In spite of all the good things that the world provides, we want the presence of God. He knew his people. He knew their way. He knew their thoughts. He knew their potential to turn their back on God. He knew their potential to complain, to seek other gods, to doubt, to fear, and to run. And so he said, I am not taking this group into the promised land unless you go with me. See, Moses also understood this, that the real evidence of God's favor was not in the apparent success that they were having, but rather in the manifested presence of God. Let that sink in for a moment. Sometimes we measure God's favor by how much success we're having. Ministry after ministry after ministry, church after church after church have left the, 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 the presence of God and have left the, 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 the Word of God and they've created their own thing and called it blessed and thousands flock to it and millions flock to it and thousands support it and millions give their millions to it. But you see, all they have is something that is attractive to the carnal man because the carnal man don't know the value of the presence of God. It's the presence of God we need. This beautiful structure here is just that. It's beautiful and it's a structure. But on, 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 unless the presence of God dwells with his people, this is just another nice building on a corner. And that's it. But when the presence of God is here, lives are changed. Rants, rescue takes place. 
Encouragement happens. Children are taught in the ways of the Lord and to fear the Lord. The things of God are valued and, and, and worship belongs to Him and not to us. The presence makes the difference. Moses knew that. He knew all about it. So he said, Lord, I want your manifested presence. He wanted something substantial in order to face the future and the uncertain times ahead. What could he do? What could he do? He's, he, he's, he's been tasked by God to take these people into the promised land, and he knows their potential. He's seen them rebel. He knows his own failures. He knows his own shortcomings. He knows his own temperament. And he's saying, oh, God, give us your presence. We want to your presence, Lord. We want your presence. Lord. We, we, we know all about the other things. We want your presence. Oh, that the cry of the church today would be, Father, we want your presence. We have the lights and we have the money and we have the buildings and we have the recognition and we have the trinkets and we have the attractions. But God, it's your presence that we need. For all of the other, when it's done, it's forgotten about. But when you've encountered the presence of God, you are changed for time and eternity. Somebody say amen. When you encounter the presence of God, no matter what the enemy lines up, you can face it. Yes, you will be, yes, you will be put through the trial, but the presence of God, the presence of God, the presence of God is what the church needs. Amen. And the church is you and I. The presence of God is not brought on by music and worship and, and singing and, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's an atmosphere. The presence of God is that personal. When God moves in a body of believers, when he moves in an individual, it happens in the middle of the night. It happens when you're driving. It happens when you come to church. It happens when you're walking in a neighbor. It's the presence of God. And you don't quite know how to deal with it. You expose yourself to being called crazy because suddenly you just want to lift your hands and worship and there's nobody around visible to worship and people think he's gone off the deep end. He shouldn't worry because he, he, there's not a whole lot of company in, off the deep end. The presence of God. Oh, church, let's not settle for the trinkets. Let's not settle with having our minds quickened or our, our thoughts giggled or our spirits lightened. Let's settle for the presence of God. Don't come in and get entertained uh, and, and go home and say, what a great evening in the house of God. He just no presence. You could have done the same thing anywhere. The presence. Moses knew the presence. And he was resolved not to go into the new year, into the new land, without the presence of God. Well, what were Moses' options? He could have formed a committee. And seek out all the latest fads for church growth. There are more seminars now about church growth than there is church growth. As pastors, we, we get to fly across our, our, our desk all the time. Come here, come see, come, come explore. And it's all something new to do, something new to do, something new to do, something new to do. To, to try to get more people and more money and bigger churches and all that sort of stuff. And it turns my stomach. He could have consulted with his friends and other leaders, but only Joshua, if you read the old story, was available after this scene with the golden calf. He could have sought counsel from professionals to talk about new ways to market the church. That's a big thing now. We got, we got, we got, we got those advisors now who tell us how to market our church. Yeah. You got to get it out there. You got to get, you know, you got to have the latest. You got to get that. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do something else. As if we had a product that we made ourselves and now needed to, ever, to get it out into the marketplace. Our product is, it was made by God. And when the marketplace is ready, you'll pour it out on them. When the church is ready, you'll pour it out on them. Most could have, most could have done all those things and said, okay, Lord, I know your presence is not going to go with us. But we're going to do these things. We're going to do these things. Of course, he could have even done the democratic thing, got an opinion from the majority of the congregation of Israel. That, that wouldn't have been too fruitful after just the most of them, except a, a handful, just worship 
a god made of earrings and, and, and jewelry that was melted down to fire. You'd have got a whole lot of wisdom from them, I'm sure. But see, they were no, in no position to give directions, seeing that they had just sinned grievously with the golden calf against God. And we're now back in the camp, which was outside the tabernacle. If you notice in verses 7 and 8, I didn't read that. But you see, here's what I like about Moses. Moses did what all godly leaders should do. He turned to God as his first and only solution. Pure Pentecostal tabernacle, I'm soon going to believe in you. I haven't counted the Sundays down, but something like seven or eight. You need to understand this truth. That what we have that we value is the presence of God. We value a lot of things, but our greatest value is on the presence of God. This house can be full. If the presence is not here, it's not serving the purpose for which God allowed it to to come into being. So Moses, I love his resolve, was determined to settle for nothing less than the presence of God. In verse 15, he said, And Moses said to God, If your presence go not with me, carry us not up from here. You say, that's an awful, that's an awful statement to make. And he says, no, he said, it was saying, God, your presence is what we need. Your presence is what we, what, what's going to keep us. Your presence is what's going to really get us there. He wasn't being stubborn. He had, he, had, he had learned from experience that when the presence of God wasn't there, things happened that are not good. He said, how will people know, God, in verse 16, how will people know that we're your people? How will people know, what's the mark, God, that we're your people? He said, God, the only mark that really defines the, uh, us to the world, he said, is that your presence is with us. Hear what I'm saying, church. You can put what name on the door you want to. You can put Pentecostal, Holy Spirit, tongue, tongue speaking, gifts using on that door. If the presence of God is not inside, it's all a big lie. It's all a big lie. You can have the best music in the world, and the presence of God is not here. It's, 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 it, that's what it is, music, entertainment. You can have the best leadership with the most flair, but if the presence is not here, that's all it is. It's come and go. So as we stand on the brink of a new year, we are already setting goals and making plans, aren't we? Usually, in the next few days, if it's not done already, there's a lot of you are going to have this, what we call New Year's resolution. I have no idea why they call it New Year's resolution. Probably new moment would be more accurate. Resolution. It has to do with diet. It has to do with exercise. It has to do with a whole number of things. After we've gorged ourselves and put 15 pound, pounds on during Christmas year, we have made a resolution. We're going to go on diet. We lose those 15 pounds and we parade ourselves as being so disciplined. Yeah. Disciplined for being at ground zero. So we're making those resolutions and those goals, the plans and, and all of those things. So I asked us this morning as a congregation, what is our resolve for 2015. Is it a better job? A new job? Is it a bigger home? Is it a new car? Is it a bigger bank account? Is it personal pleasure and ease? I suppose Moses could have said, yeah, we're not going to have the presence, but we're finally going to get there. This year, we're going to enter into the promised land. We're going to get out of this wilderness. We're going to get rid of this boring food. Imagine almost 40 years living on uh, chicken and bread. Think about that for a moment. 40 years, they lived on manna and quail. Hmm. Hmm. It's no wonder a lot of Jews don't go to Swiss Chalet. <laughs> I just, 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 
I just, just figured it out. Yeah, I wouldn't either if, I, if my ancestors lived 40 years on, on that stuff. Wow. Moses could have said, you know, I give it a good shot. Did my best. We haven't got his presence, but we do have his angel. That's what God promised, wasn't it? God said, I won't go with you, but I'll send my angel. I'll send an angel. So Moses could have said, well, you know, we got God's angel. But see, Moses would not settle for anything less than the presence of God. Now, you can call that stubborn if you want to. But it was a resolve that pleased the Lord. Because Moses knew that God's presence, folks, when I'm talking about God's presence, I'm not just talking about an ordinary church service. Ooh. I'm talking about when he shows up. There's a difference between coming to a church service and going through it and getting out and so sure is glad that's over than walking into a red hot presence of God. You know what I'm talking about? I want this pre His presence. I want His presence. I want His presence. And when we come together, let's bring the presence with us. Empty vessels can't bring water. But when vessels are filled with that water, they can, they can come to that place and do what it's supposed to do. God's presence is with us when we make time for God's presence. But if we only give God two hours on Sunday morning... It's not going to happen, folks. It's not going to happen. Presence is nurtured. Relationship is nurtured. And that's what presence is. Presence is that ongoing, intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Whether we're a John the Baptist on the, on the Isle of Patmos alone, or whether we're in the midst of a large audience. It's the presence. We bring the presence with us. Oh, I forget his name. We know him as Brother Andrew, but I forget his name. He wrote, he, he wrote on the practice of the presence of God. How many have read the, the, little, the little booklet? See what I mean? Maybe four or five people. Half a dozen people. How many of us would have read it that says, How to be a millionaire in 12 days? <laughs> I want that one. He talked, he, he, he talked about this concept of practicing the presence, something meant that we have this understanding that, 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 that we live in the presence of God and He lives amongst us. Believe it or not, I'm speaking to Pentecostals this morning. Pentecostals, believe it or not, we know how to compartmentalize our lives. Sunday morning is to come to church, and that's where we encounter God. That's the reason why I come Sunday mornings. And we live that way. We're busy all week. We don't talk to God. We don't, we don't spend time with God. We don't chill out with God, if I could use that term, and just get alone with no agenda. Because we got disappointed with God for His presence every Sunday morning. And folk, that's detrimental personally and it's detrimental to the church. The presence of God is that which we nurture within us and amongst us all the time. And so Brother Andrew talked about practicing the presence. Brother Andrew was a, um, a Christian who was a cook. He spent most of his life in a monastery working in a kitchen. And that is where he had his greatest encounter with God. Because in the midst of his devoted life to, to, to serving the institution that he was part of, 
He practiced the presence of God continually. And I, wrote, I read his letters, and, and his letters was, were responses to people who, who talked about how they never had time because life demanded so much from them, and their, their job was a unique job, and, and so they, 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 they didn't have this time. And, and his whole thinking and teaching and, and life's experience was, look, look, we can practice the presence of God. Wherever we are, the presence of God is. Whoa. And, and we nurture that. While we're at our workstation, we are worshiping. I don't mean we're robbing our employer of our time. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, we're doing the best job that that employer ever had done. But we're worshiping. Our heart's in tune. Our ear is listening. The Spirit of God is speaking. And, and it may not be audible. And most times it's not. But there's an atmosphere of the presence of God. We practice the presence of God. See, you don't commit adultery when you're practicing the presence of God. You don't commit fornication when you're practicing the presence of God. You don't steal when you're practicing the presence of God. You're not backbiting when you're practicing the presence of God. You're not conjuring up theme, theme, ways to get even with people when you're practicing the presence of God. The presence, the presence, the presence. The presence. Church, we've got to have the presence of God. And it's not a... It's not one of those, God doesn't have this big, I, I've watched them make these uh, birthday cakes. I've, I've looked into the windows sometimes, I don't know where, a little while ago. Oh yeah, I stopped at uh, Fortino's. I don't like grocery shopping. But I stopped at Fortino's. Once in a while I just get in the mood to walk around somewhere. So I went to Fortino's and they were making cakes. And I was amazed. The young lady here was just a little thing. She had the cake made, and then she began to decorate it. And, and she had, it was on a wheel, and, and she would move it around. And as she moved around, she'd squeeze this. You girls know what I'm talking about. So, and some of you guys. It's in a little sack with a hole in the bottom. Yeah. And, uh, and she'd, she'd, she'd squeeze this thing, and, 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 uh, and th this blob of a sugar-free icing would come out. <laughs> and... Uh, I, that's the reason why I, I, I can have a snack once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, and then, then it, it would keep going. And, th then, and so she'd make, she'd make one cake with these little lumps of red and blue and yellow. Uh, and then th th she'd miss a little spell. And then there'd be another lump and she'd miss a little spell. And then, another lump. And then there was another one she would make where, where she, just, she just kept it going. And she just... And no, no matter where the cake was it, was, it was bound to get a dab, a good dab of this icing. Well, you see, practicing the presence of God is simply this, that we, we practice the sense of his presence with us. He, he's there with us all the time to pour it onto us. It's not like, okay, uh, Sunday morning, Lord, at, two, at, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be at Peel Pentecostal or 1030. And from 1030 to 1230, I I, I'm going to be stopped. So, sure, Lord, drop the dab on me. There's a couple of problems with that. A little dab will never do you. I don't believe it. What we need in the presence of God is that constant practicing of His presence. When you're driving, when you're working, when you're eating, when you're conversing, when you're playing golf, when you're relaxing. I felt God on the, on the golf course where I, practically, I guess I've had to drop my clubs and just lift my hands and praise the Lord. Look around, make sure people didn't think I was crazy. I didn't want no ambulance. I, I didn't want no ambulance showing up on the 80th hole. The presence of God, church. The convert, the opposite side of that, I've also known when the presence of God has not been there. And I've said, Lord, what's, 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 what's going on? What's wrong? What's wrong, Lord? What, what, what's going on in my life that the presence is not there anymore? That's a great message to preach sometime. When you miss the presence... And we get so busy sometimes, pastors don't, but he's just so busy, so frustrated, dealing with problems, dealing with schedules not met, dealing with disappointments, dealing with emergencies, and we get exhausted sometimes because we don't practice the presence. Moses said, I ain't going. I ain't going on as you go with me. It was nothing less than the presence of God. But Moses knew it was the sin of the people 
and why God was withdrawing his presence. The sin, and this is a matter concerning the golden calf. And we learned this lesson that sin always hinders the presence of God. We've all experienced it. Come on, there's nobody perfect in this place. We all know sometimes we've, met a, we've been out of line with what God wanted us to be. And we went on for a few days trying to justify it, and then we suddenly had to get down and say, Oh, God, it's me, and I need your forgiveness. I need your forgiveness, Lord. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that, Lord. You, 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 you lifted that sweet anointing off me when I, when, I, when, I, when I entertained that. And Lord, would you forgive me? How many have, how many have had to do that? I've got both hands up. Most of you are p- perfect. So you'll put up with my preaching this morning. Folk, it's called practicing the presence of God. See, Sin always enters the presence. Listen to, listen to what David felt when he sinned with Bathsheba. In Psalm 51 and 11, he said, Oh, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. God lifted the presence of, of the Holy Spirit from David with his sin with Bathsheba. Because in sin, he was miserable. That sweet fellowship that he had enjoyed with God as a shepherd out in the fields at night. When, when the enemy came, he slew the, the lion, he slew the bear. Out when the, when, in the, under these beautiful starlit nights, uh, as he watched the sheep, the Spirit of God was upon him. And he wrote most maybe of his psalms. And then suddenly it was gone. And he felt like a naked man before a, a large audience. No covering. Shame, no peace. And he had just had to get back and say, Oh God, forgive me, I have sinned. That sweet approval that he had enjoyed as, with, with God as a king was suddenly gone. And he had to find that place of repentance. Well, today I believe the church is no different. We've replaced the joy of God's presence. Psalm 16 and 11 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. We've replaced the joy of God's presence with the surrogate joy called entertainment. If we can get entertained, it'll fill up the emptiness in us. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. When the entertainment is finished being in God's house, our presence becomes boring. We're, we're anxious to rush out instead of wait in God's presence. Why? Ever think about that? Why? Because there is very little relationship left. See, look at the crowds today. They come for the entertainment. Every club and a lot, far too many churches have their billboards filled with what? Entertainment. Come and hear. Come and see. And the crowds come. And when the entertainment is finished, the crowds leave. Very little, if anything, changed. Why? Because the presence of God has been left behind. The relationship is broken. David cried, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation in Psalm 51. God's presence will always bring joy. I'm I'm rushing through. This year, 2015, that's coming, will be a battle for the mind and the soul more than for the body and for financial things. Satan has ramped it up. The Scripture says he knows that his time is short. He has ramped it up. And he has every angel of hell at his his finest strength anti-Christ shape to deceive the body of Christ, which is the church. This will be a spiritual battle as we near the end. Therefore, we need spiritual direction more than human counsel. We need spiritual direction more than human counsel. I'm saying to the church this morning, to Peel Pentecostal, as we go into 2015, let's add the resolve of Moses, God's presence for our present and our future. Amen. 
Let's make that our resolve. You see, in 2015, if we so desire, God's presence will not only be our joy, it'll be a place of refuge. The psalmist discovered that in the 31st Psalm, verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 40 and 31 calls the presence of God a place of renewed strength. How many would say spiritually to me this morning or just say personally and acknowledge I need more spiritual strength? I do. I need more spiritual strength. Folk, the battle that we're going to face in 2015 is, is unprecedented. We're already being targeted because we're an old-fashioned God-believing church. And there are enemies out there that are too strong for us. And the only strength that we can have is the strength that comes from the presence of the Lord. That's the only strength that's going to count. No matter who fills this pulpit, no matter how wise that person is, it's only the strength of the Lord. Only the strength of the Lord. Only the values, the values that I've been talking about is presence. Exodus 33, and I read it to you, it's a place of rest. The presence of the Lord is a place of rest. I have seen people going through the most incredible crisis of their lives in my 30 years of ministry, and I've seen them at such rest. I, I kind of, I don't know, I probably said to my wife, do they know this really happened? Do, do they realize how serious this is? But the rest and the peace and presence of God. I've gone to visit some old saints of God, and I, I've, I've been putting my words together, say, how do we deal with this? And I'm sure you pastors have done this. How, how do we deal with this? How, you know, how do you go in? We've had crises after crises, and with sudden deaths on highways, and, and walking into someone's home and saying, your son was just killed, your husband was just killed, whatever the case might have been. I've had this happen. I've walked into the home. I didn't know quite know what to do. I didn't know quite, quite know what to say. And I blurted something out. And I realized that person was in the very presence of God. They weren't oblivious to what had happened. They weren't on hindered or on hurt by what had happened. But the presence of God was stronger than the other emotions of their lives. I've seen some of God's, what I thought was finest people fall right apart. Completely fall apart. In my 30 years of ministry, I've, I've said to my wife when I come and what do you make of that? They've been so strong. They've been so... The presence of God, folks. The presence of God. The presence of God is what we're talking about here. There's, it's a place of rest. Deuteronomy 20 and 1. I don't have time to deal with all this. But it's a place of courage. In Isaiah 43, it's a place of comfort. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. It's a place of strength and comfort. I'm asking Susan and her musicians and singers to come back. He said, I'll be with you when you go through that. And through the rivers they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. What will be the distinguishing mark to the world about us as a body of believers in 2015? Think about it. How will the world know we are God's people. That's what Moses said. How will the heathen know we are people? And the church must ask the same question. How will the world know that we are your people, Lord? Think about it for a moment. When you leave today, think about it. How will the world know that we are God's people? How will they see us living? How will they hear us acting? How will they, the language that we use and the, and the life that we live and the priorities that we have and, and the way we behave ourselves and the way we interconnect and interrelate and communicate will either demonstrate that we're just one of the world. Oh, yeah, we go to church. We do it on Sunday, but Monday to Saturday we're one of the world. Or will they say, I've never seen anything like that before. Who, who, who are you? How can you be so honest? How can you be so transparent? How can you be so caring? How, how, what's that all about? And our answer must be because we live in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. How come you're pleasant all the time? What are you getting? 
grumpy once in a while? Why do you get mad once in a while? How come you're always pleasant? When we live in the, when we practice His presence, when we practice His presence, when we practice His presence, all of these things and many, many more that I haven't shared this morning will become realities in our lives. See, there's really nothing wrong with losing the war. You know, we want to win the war. But it's our actions, our words, or our ambitions, or our priorities, whatever the case might be. See, there's nothing wrong with losing the war as long as we don't lose the presence. As long as we don't lose the presence. How many are desirous this morning for a fresh presence of God? How many would, would, would I, 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 this is the last Sunday of the year, great time to do this. How many would stand and, and just, just stand and come and stand here and say, this year, I want to embrace and encounter the presence of God in my life on a continual basis. How many would come and stand here and I'm not going to demand anything of you this morning. This is just your personal, I'm just encouraging you to do this. But say, I'm going to have the resolve of Moses. Moses, God said, Moses, I'm going to send my angel. And Moses, not good enough. It's your presence, Lord. It's your presence, Lord. It's your presence, Lord. It's your presence, Lord. It's your presence. Make room. Just fill, fill them up. Line up against the walls. Just move. If, 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 if you want a more greater sense of the presence of God in you and in what you do and in your family, in your home, in your daily life. Just move forward. Some of you are going to get to the altar. Some of you are going to stop at the aisleways. Some of you are going to stop at, uh, somewhere else. But just don't, don't sit in your seat unless you don't want His presence. Unless you don't want His presence. If you, if you had, had, have any degree of desire for His sweet presence in 2015 as Moses had, in spite of all the other good things you might have, move forward. Susan's going to lead us, and this is our prayer unto the Lord. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Yes. Oh, in your presence, Lord. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of
how true is your presence. Your presence, Lord. Lord, show us your presence. Show us your presence, Lord. A thousand directions. A thousand directions we will go in. Oh, God.
Father, let your presence, Lord, let your presence rest upon us. Dwell within us, oh God, and go with us wherever we go. Lord, help us not to offend your presence. To walk righteous before you by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, it's your presence, it's your presence, Lord, it's your presence in our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, your presence, Lord, it's your presence, amen. Lord, it's your presence that sets us apart. Our Lord, it's your presence that sets us apart. Lord is your presence. Lord is your presence. Lord is your presence. Lord is your presence. Lord is your presence that defines us. Oh God is your presence that defines us. Lord, it's your presence that defines us. stand in your presence this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your miracle work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, as we recall the past year that's about to slip away from us with just three days left. Lord, you have been so good. 
you have been so good. And Lord, where we have faced difficult, you have been difficulties, you have been gracious. Lord, you have provided for every need and much, 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 much more besides. But Father, again, we're fully aware of our emptiness without your presence, our abject poverty without your presence. Lord, we can't live on the times of the past. When we look into 2015, oh God, each one of us individually, then corporately as a church, and Lord, we want your presence. And we know, Lord, that we have, the nurt- we have to nurture that presence. We know, Lord, that you are there. You know you're with us, Lord, but we want to, we want to nurture that presence of God in our lives. Lord, through your word, through your spirit, through our ways and our words and our works, Lord, we want you to guide us and direct us. We want you, Lord, to go with us. Lord, 2015 holds, should you tarry massive changes for our world. Great changes, Lord, for our, our own neighborhoods. Great changes, Lord, in our personal lives. But Lord, in your presence is with us. That's a fresh opportunity to explore you and to know you and to see you in all of your majesty and glory and might and power. Father, thank you for your provisions. We receive them in grateful hearts. They've been abundant, Lord. Help us to disseminate them to others, to bless others, Lord, as you've blessed us. But Lord, help us never to compromise your presence in our lives. Lord, we're frail, we're weak. We come short. But Lord, in your presence, you remind us of your need and you come, Lord, with the healing balm that restores us again. And Father, we just sing about it. Restore unto us, Lord, the joy of your presence in our personal lives, our family lives, our church life. Father, in the name of Jesus, upon every ministry and minister, Lord, there will be the joy of the Lord and the presence of God. Upon every family in this audience, oh God, as they, as they seek your face, the presence of the Lord will overwhelm them. Lord, people will release from bondages that they've struggled with for years. Lord, people will release with, from, 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 from lukewarmness that they've struggled with for years as they walk in your presence and encounter the presence of God. Lord, sit this place in a large place, Lord, this house in a large place, that we might be hidden and you might be glorified. Father, let families be brought together this year. Let tensions be removed, oh God, in families through the presence of God. Let healing take place, physical, spiritual, emotional, and relational, through the presence of God. These are all the things that come from your presence, Father. And we want them. So help us, Lord, to one by one, individually and in corporate as a body, to be a Moses. Help us to have the resolve of Moses. Lord, this year we might lose a job. We might have have adversity. Thanks, Lord, would, would show up in the lost column. But, Lord, let it not be said of any one of us, as individuals or a family or a church, that your presence ever falls in the lost column. Lord, let it be a constant as we nurture it, as we humble ourselves, as we hear what the Spirit is saying to us and to the church. Father, we love you. We're overwhelmed. Our words are so empty. Our words are so inadequate to say thank you. But Lord, you know our hearts. You know our hearts, Lord. Today I say thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your patience, for your mercy, and your long suffering towards me and towards us as a people, oh God. We commit ourselves to you and step into 2015 with the confidence not of our own and not of the world or man's thinking, but with the confidence of your word and the promise of your Holy Spirit. Lord, with anticipation in our hearts, Lord, that this could be the greatest year ever for the church, Lord, in earth and in heaven, amen. It could be the year of your return, but Lord, it can be and will be the year of great evangelism and outreach and, Lord, great work done, Lord, from coast to coast, uh, Lord, from nation to nation, uh, Lord, because you are getting your bride ready, amen. And, Lord, she's going to be the one that's watching for you and looking for you, amen. Lord, they're here to the ground and her eyes towards heaven, uh, Lord, working for you and watching for you at the same time. Let this be the congregation, oh God. Let this be the individuals who will set the pace in desiring you like never before. Father, I thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for 2014, Lord. We look back at it. And Lord, we've seen so many wonderful things. Wednesday night, Lord, great celebration to look at the things, Lord, that you've done. But also, Lord, to anticipate what you're going to do. But Lord, one thing only I desire 
and that is that your presence will go with us. We don't want second best. The angels are good. The angels are good, but they're second best. We want your presence to fill our lives, our homes, our families, our church, and we present it to you, Lord, as a church that loves you and is serving you and accomplishing your purposes. Lord, let 2015 Trinity Terry glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you.